Uh, Matthew chapter 14. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 14 this morning. I have been reading this story (coughs) for all week, and it's really captured my attention. It's captured my heart, and I've been wrestling all week with this story. I know that there was something in there that I felt like God wanted to get my attention on in terms of where we're sort of to go uh, with with, um, preaching for the next few weeks. I didn't exactly know where it was to go. Uh, because there's so much wonderful stuff in the story of Peter walking on the water. Who's read the story of Peter getting out of the boat and walking on the water? Matthew chapter 14, it says in verse, starting in verse 22, it says, Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowd. I remember many, many years ago, uh, I went to the Solomon Islands, and some of you may have heard this story, but I'm going to share it again. I went to the Solomon Islands, I uh, used to take teams in and out of the islands, and one particular year, I went to the, uh, had to go over to the islands in a really quick trip to plan a, a, a trip where I was coming back in two weeks' time, uh, because there's no point trying to email these remote islands, and I was trying to ring contacts I had, and there's only one sort of phone on certain islands, and so I had to fly over there and... and uh, land in Honiara and then catch a boat from the island of Guadalcanal across to the island of Malaita in order to organise this ministry for this group of young kids I was bringing. So I said to Jackie this particular trip, hey, um, circumstances kind of worked out with the kids and that, why don't you come with me to the Solomon Islands? It'll, we're in and out in a, in a couple of days, it'll be awesome. So she said, yeah, I'd love to do that. She hadn't been there before. So we got our tickets, our passports, all that organised, jumped on the plane. We flew out to Honiara. We landed in Honiara. I went to this little um, sort of hotel-y type thing and dropped our bags off and dropped Jackie off and said, Jackie, I'm going to go down to the harbour because I've been to the islands before. Um, I just go down to the boat harbour and there's fishing boats and all kinds of boats. I just find someone that's going to Malaita, give them a couple of dollars and they let me get on their boat and across we go. And so I said, I'll go down to the harbour and I'll find the boat that's going to take us across to Malaita. We'll organise, we'll come back and so on. So I go down to the harbour and I organise this boat and the guy says, yep, no worries, be here at midnight. We're going to leave at midnight. So if you're here at midnight, jump on the boat and I'll I'll take you across (coughs) to Malaita. So I run back up to the hotel and said to Jackie, awesome, it's organised. Let's just have a little bit of a sleep, bit of a nap, bit of a rest, get up, we'll freshen up, we'll jump on the boat. And it's it's about a four hour, I think it was about... Roughly about a four hour, meant to be about, meant to be, let me phrase, meant to be about four hour trip across the, uh, the water to Malaita. We get down there at midnight, we jump on the boat, and of course we're sitting on, there's a sort of a top light deck and a lower deck, and we're sitting there, and there's all this, the crew of the boat are there. There's a bunch of, of, of mothers with little tiny children. There's, there's a few chickens and animals. And there's these massive big 44-gallon drums of petrol because, of course, on Malaita there's no petrol plant. So they have to ship it into Honiara and they take the petrol across for the handful of cars and machinery and stuff that's over there. So we get on the boat and the boat's chugging along and it's, there's a few lights on the sort of horizon where you can see the little islands. And all of a sudden we get out from between the islands and there's this patch of open sea. We're going along and all of a sudden the boat starts sort of just gently going like this. I wasn't doing that before. It was just nice and flat. Then it just starts getting bigger. And then it just gets bigger. And then all of a sudden it starts not only going up and down, but it starts going side to side as well. And um, my wife is not the biggest fan of boats. Uh, in order to get her there, I did tell her that this was smooth sailing because every other time I've been there, it's always been smooth sailing. What we didn't know is we were the last plane to get out of Brisbane Airport before all flights were shut down because of a big cyclone or something that was coming through. Of course, we didn't know that uh, because we weren't, you know, back then looking at news weather reports and stuff on phones. So we get out there in this open ocean. Before you know it, the boat is just being battered. It's up and down. It's side to side. And I looked at Jackie, and what gave it away was I could only see from there up on her fingers. The rest of it was actually dug into this wooden panel that she was sitting on. And I figured, hey, she must be quite nervous at this stage. So, of course, I thought being the man, it's my part of my role. I want to comfort my wife, support my wife. So I, I start going through my brain and going, okay, so, so uh, you know, what can I say to her to sort of calm her down? <laughs> so I said to her, well, Jackie, um, it doesn't really matter just stay relaxed because the crew who do this all the time, they're not panicking, they're fine. Well, no sooner had I said that, a couple of the crew start going, ah, 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 
and they start raising their voices and panicking. And the next thing you know, these big petrol drums uh, start sliding from one side of the boat, bang. And then it would tip up and these big, they'd slide bang against, and the crew would start yelling and screaming. Then the mothers are yelling and screaming. The kids are crying. The chickens are running around. And I'm thinking, strike one. That didn't work. No good. So I thought, okay, what can I say? What can I say? What can I say? I said, well, here's the thing. Um, It's it's okay because, you know, modern shipbuilding is based on Noah's Ark. It all comes from Noah's Ark. I don't know if that was completely true, but it comes from Noah's Ark. And so if we do sort of roll, we'll come back up. And then I realized after I'd said that, that's a dumb one. Strike two. That's not much comfort either, is it? So I thought I'll go for the only last one I have. And I'm standing up against the side of the boat, bracing myself, going everywhere. And I said, Jackie, at the end of the day, it's okay. The water's out there, not in here. We're not taking in any water. And the minute I said that, it was almost like God laughed at me and said, you reckon? A wave jacked up behind me, hit me in the head. I fell face first on the floor of the boat as water came into the boat. And in the end, I gave up and said, God, she's you now. She's up to you. You've got to do something. So uh, it wasn't a very pleasant trip on that particular boat. But you know what I learned on that trip in the boat? Here's, here's what I learned. You're not in control in the boat either. You know, we talk about getting out of the boat. We kind of feel like it's, it's a place where we're, where we're really out of control and it's a, a place of adventure. And it is, but here's the reality. You're not in control out of the boat, but you're not in control in the boat either. You've got just as much control inside the boat. And that's what these guys found as well in this story. It goes on, it says, During the fourth watch of the night, in verse 25, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. And when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said. And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus said to them, take courage, it's I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith. He said, why did you doubt? Peter cops a bit of a rough sort of a mention quite often. Peter's, you know, we talk about Peter in a fairly, uh, quite often in a negative light, like Peter was the buffhead of the 12 who spoke without thinking, who thought he was better than Jesus, thought he knew more than God, thought he was the leader of the pack when he probably wasn't. Um, Peter gets a bit of a a negative rap, and I get it. I do understand when you read um, the life of Peter. But let's not forget, for a very brief moment, Peter actually walked on water. Amen? For a very brief moment, Peter walked on water. Jesus says to him, why did you doubt? I'll tell you what, here's, here's something. I wish that I had such little faith that I could walk on water. You know? I wish I had that little amount of faith that I could walk on water. It doesn't take a lot, apparently. I wish that I had such little faith that I could walk on water. Peter did some things right. And when I was reading this passage this week, the thing that kept on popping into my head is this. What does it take to walk on water? What does it actually take to walk on water? I mean, first of all, what does walking on water actually mean in 2021? Does it mean that each of us should leave the service this morning? We're all going to go to somebody's house with a pool and let's practice walking on the top of the pool. I don't think it means that. But I do think there's some relevance, and I do think the concept and the idea of walking on water is very relevant to us today. And as I spent time reading this passage this week, to be honest with you, I found that much in it that I'm not going to fit it into one Sunday morning. So I'm going to spend a few weeks reading about Peter walking on the water. But the question that I want to tackle is this. What does it take to walk on water? What does it actually take to walk on water? Somebody did it once, and his name was Peter. What does it take to walk on water? You know, I reckon where we are as a gathering, I feel like we're being challenged by God to walk on water, if I can be honest. I feel like this, this, this season where we've been talking about the Holy Spirit, where we're looking at the Holy Spirit, uh, what we're doing tonight is really about walking on water. I want some of you to make the decision tonight to step out of the boat. And it is a decision, by the way. Peter, at the end of the day, had to make a choice. He had to make a choice. He had a whole bunch of things going on. He had people beside him. He had weather. He had all sorts of things. At the end of the day, Jesus didn't walk up to the boat, grab Peter, and rip him out of the boat 
Peter made a choice to get out of the boat. And what we're going to be doing tonight, I guess, in one sense, is I'm encouraging people. Here's an opportunity for you to step out of the boat. Peter got up a second ago and talked about these dinners and said, you know what, this is not a gathering of your best friends. What we're encouraging you to do is get out of the boat. Go and meet somebody that you don't have deep relationship with yet. Step out of the boat. Do something that's a little outside of yourself. Expand the borders of your tents. Do something a bit unfamiliar. Try something new. Step outside of the boat. So what does it take to walk on water? I just want to mention one thing this morning. The first thing that I see in the life of Peter that it takes to step out of the boat, the first thing I see that it takes to walk on water is this. You've got to overcome the fear of man. You've got to overcome the fear of man. Uh, Proverbs 25, uh, 29 verse 25 says this. It says, The fear of man will prove to be a snare. The New King James just puts it this way, the fear of man brings a snare. But whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. There's this contrast between fearing man on one side and trusting God in the other. That, that word snare, it, it was a, a thing, thing uh, literally was something that was used in the context of hunting. It can be also translated bait or lure. Any fishermen in the place or fisher women? Sorry, any fisher people in this place? Troy, we've got one fisher person. You should have all put your hand up and said, well, brother, we're all fishers of men. You missed the moment there, right there. Waldorf, you got your snappy snappy at the start. You missed it there. Um, it's, it's the word bait or the word lure. Now, when you go fishing, and I fish quite a bit, and I and, uh, haven't for a little while, but, but I love fishing, was brought up fishing. You, you put a lure on your line, and, and the idea of the lure or the bait is you want to change the trajectory of the, of the fish, don't you? You throw the lure, and there's a fish over here just going along, minding his own business. Next thing, there's a plop over there. Now, the fish wasn't going over there. The fish was going over here. Or there's a prawn that plops. Over. He wasn't going over there. He was going over here. But the bait or the lure is designed to try to get the fish to change the direction that he's heading in, not knowing that that change of direction is going to cost you something. That change of direction is going to cost you something. You're over here with your mates playing fish ball or flick the fins or whatever it is they do underwater to keep themselves happy. They're over here, and then there's a plop over there. And then all of a sudden the fish looks, ooh, there's that piece of red plastic. Little piece of red plastic, got a flippy tail in the, ooh, we're going to go and check it out. So they run over here and they check it out. And before you know it, one of them says, I'm going to take a chunk out of that. Bang, he bites it. Next thing you know, he's being dragged up, Woo! Up out of the boat. He never intended. When he woke up, this was not what I thought the day would be like. But he was tempted. He was lured away. He was caught in a snare. And the snare is designed, the bait's designed, the lure's designed to take you in another direction than the direction that you're meant to be going. One direction could lead to life, but the snare, the bait, it's not going to lead to life. The end game is it's going to lead to death. The fear of man is a snare that leads to to death. And if we come under the fear of man, to the degree that we come under the fear of man is the degree to which we miss out on the fullness of what God has for us, doing what God wants us to do, and becoming who God wants us to become. I look at my own life and I often ask myself this question. I often ask myself this question. At age, I'm almost 50. I'm going to be 50 next year. When I turn 50, I, I often think, God, if, if I could sit down with you, God, and be brutally honest, let, like, let's have a brutal, honest conversation here, you and me. I want you to tell me, did you envision that this is who I would be and what I would be doing at 50 in your wildest dreams? Is this what you thought? I'm not, I'm not getting down on myself. Life happens. I didn't determine who I was born to, where I was born, what season I was born in. I didn't determine a lot of things that happened to me as a child. I'm in control of my responses. I'm in control of my reactions. But I can't control a lot of the things that did happen. And they're a part of my story. So I'm not asking it from a, I'm down on myself or I'm not in the will of God. None of that stuff. I mean, the will of God is not... Some people talk about the will of God like it's the eye of a needle. You know, and you've got to get everything perfect your whole life in order to be in that. If the will of God is the eye of a needle, I'll guarantee everybody in this room is outside of it. 
Because I'll guarantee you at some point we made some decision or we, we, we talked to the wrong person or, we, or we, we, we stopped at the wrong time or we didn't walk at the right time or we read the wrong book that changed the sign up in my brain that I think this way. We, we, if the, eye, the will of God was an eye of a needle, none of us would be in it. So I don't believe the will of God is the eye of a needle. But I more ask that question from the perspective of God. In your wildest dreams, if I was completely trusting in you and not coming under the fear of man, what would my life look like? What would my life look like? On a practical level, there's a lot of things I didn't do growing up because of the fear of man. And I'm glad. I'm, I love my life. I'm happy where I've landed. But you know, when I was younger, I wanted to be a rock singer. Anyone, anyone else in the room want to be a rock star when you were a kid? Come on, be honest. Be honest. Yeah, I thought you would have, right? <laughs> hey, in my eyes, baby, you're still a rock star. I wanted to be a rock star. You know why I didn't? Fear of man. I was afraid. What would people think? If I stood up and everyone was looking at me and I sang, what if I sucked? <laughs> what if I was hopeless? What if I sang out of tune? I had the charisma. I could probably pull it off with a bit of charismatic movements on stage. And I go back to my generation and go, well, half of them couldn't sing anyway. I would have been a rock star. You know? That's enough for you. You've seen me dance. You know I rock it. But I wonder, sometimes I wonder, how much has the fear of man influenced and shaped me? to be who I am. Even in the context of church, how much has the fear of man played havoc with my faith and me expressing myself? I, I, I remember sharing, I've shared with a few of you guys my experience in the islands that time when I went over there one time and, and, and during a worship service, I noticed all these guys jumping up and clapping. And I did something that I don't normally do. I started jumping up and clapping with them in worship. I'm just, my feet actually left the ground. I didn't think that was humanly possible. I honestly didn't think. I thought these feet, I'll never, you'll never get two of these feet off the ground unless there's a football in my hand. All of a sudden, my hands are in the air. And, I, and you know what? Within myself, I felt such a freedom and such a liberty. It's not that everybody has to do that, but in that moment, I realized something, Alan, that's the real uninhibited you. That's who you are. You know? And I remember, I, I, this is that same team that I went over to organize, came back to Australia and uh, got all these young people up in front of the, the church that Sunday morning and they were all sharing their testimonies and stories of what God had done in the islands. And then I remember we finished with worship. And I remember when worship started and uh, that was a really sort of a, you know, rocking sort of energy sort of a song. And uh, I remember I lifted my hands and I thought, here we go. And then I went to jump. And you know what happened? It was almost like somebody had driven nails through my feet and they wouldn't get off the ground. I'm doing these ones. Must have looked like I was having some sort of troubles, you know. Like, and I'm looking down going, God, why can't I get my feet off the ground? And I realized, I wonder what people will think of me if both my feet got off the ground at once. What would these people think of me? Would they think I'm some weird Pentecostal freak show worshiping God? What would they think? It's amazing how the fear of man can... Oh, you ever see people, they go downtown and they'll be walking down the street and there's no one in the street, but then as soon as somebody comes towards them, they get the phone out. I often wonder, why do that? I've done that. I go, why am I doing that? I wonder, is, it, is there something there? Is, is it this fear of man, this insecurity? Well, what, why, why would I pick up a... What did I used to do before I had a mobile phone in my pocket and people walked towards me? <laughs> Cross the street, go to the other side, turn my back and walk backwards. What did we do? The fear of man is a snare. I, 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 back in... Uh, when I was about 15, I lived in a... a just before I moved up here, in, in grade 7, I went to, I think, about 8 different high schools all across New South Wales. My mother was a gypsy, not with a horse and cart, but she just moved every month or so. She'd, I'd get off the bus at school and she'd say, oh, we're going to visit a friend. And after a while, I realised visit a friend means we're completely moving town. Um, and one of the places we ended up in at one point was a place called Mudgee. Anyone ever been to Mudgee? Wonderful, wonderful place. I, I love Mudgee. I went through there a few years ago um, with my wife. Totally different town than when I lived there. Totally different <laughs> But I remember uh, I went to Mudgee High School and I was there and uh, one, um, excuse me, one Thursday, some guy got up at, at an assembly and said, hey, just a reminder, tomorrow after school, all of the army cadets are getting on the bus and the army cadets will be going out bush and we're going to dump them out bush for um, 48 hours. We pick them up Sunday night and we drop them home. It must be some thing that they do as part of their training. And I thought, man, doesn't that sound awesome? 48 hours in the bush with your mates, no teachers, no adults. Wouldn't that be unreal? So as soon as our school was finished, I went and found the Army Cadet recruiter guy and said, look, I really feel like I'd love to join the Army Cadets. He goes, oh, that's great. Uh, I don't know if we can get you ready in time, but we're actually doing it. I said, no, I'll work it out. 
So I ran home and found a shovel and a few little tool things that you had to have and put them in a bag, rocked up the next day, jumped on the bus after school. They took us a couple of hours out into the middle of the bush and you could never do this today, I'm sure. Um, And they just literally kicked us off the bus and said, we'll be back in 48 hours. And so we're all about 15 and we're all out in the middle of the bush with nothing. We weren't allowed to take food. We weren't allowed to take anything. We had to build our own uh, little hutties to sleep under. We had to catch our own food. We had to cook our own food, start our fires. We had to do all that ourselves without the luxury of any type of technology other than we were allowed to take a little shovel. So we got out there and next thing you know, we're dumped and everybody splits and I had me and a couple of my mates. I had a, a mate of mine, we used to call him Rocker. Rocker was his name. And so Rocker says, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to build a little hutchie over here. We build the hutchie, and then we go walking, and he says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to catch a rabbit. So I go, sweet, no worries. And so how are we going to catch a rabbit? We found a rabbit hole, and we built a snare. And what we did is we put the the sort of loop around the rabbit hole, and then you tie it to a tree. And the idea is when the rabbit comes out, he gets his his head in the thing, and as he hops off, it tightens around his neck, and the rabbit's stuck there, and then you you come and you find the rabbit, and before you know it, you've got rabbit stew or salty chicken. That's what rabbit tastes like. And so we set up this trap and uh, Rocker, you know, sets up this rabbit trap as everybody else did. Uh, the thing is, everybody else's rabbit trap actually worked. The snare actually worked. They caught rabbits in ours. Praise God, Rocker had the foresight to pack steaks and sausages and all kinds of things into his backpack that the teachers didn't know about. We had a feast that night around the fire, our little group. But the thing is this, the people did catch rabbits. You know what's the frightening thing about a snare? The most frightening thing I found about a snare is this. It doesn't kill you, ultimately, it just restricts your freedom, which in the end kills you. I watched rabbits get the noose around their head. But you know what? Those rabbits could still hop within a sort of however long that thing was. They were still moving around. They weren't dead. The snare gives the illusion that you're free, but there's a point where it stops you and says, uh uh-uh, uh, you can't go beyond there. Now, for any other reason than you're caught in a snare. That's what the fear of man does. It's a snare. It restricts our freedom. I think God came to give us freedom. Amen? God wants to give us liberty and God wants to give us life. Yet I wonder in how many areas of our world are we restricted by fear of man? How many areas of our world are we limited because we're too worried about what people think? I'm not talking about going out and being rude. I'm not talking about going out and doing things that are disrespectful. I'm not talking about doing things that are harmful to other people. But I'm talking about being who we're meant to be and doing what it is that God put us here to be able to do. The deceptive thing about a snare is it doesn't kill you, but it simply limits your freedom. Fear of man will stop you becoming who you were meant to be. I wonder what Peter was thinking before he made the call out to Jesus. Peter started sinking. And it says that he called out to Jesus. I wonder if it crossed his mind at all. Oh, hang on a second. What are the boys going to think if I actually admit that I'm struggling? What were the guys in the boat? I mean, they're high-fiving me. They're, they're, give me a P, P, give me an E as I'm walking on the water. Give me a T, me an R. Go, Peter, woo! And all of a sudden, he starts sinking. I wonder what they'll think if I cry out. Maybe I should just try to tough this out myself. You know? I wonder what they'll think if I actually admit that I've got a problem. I wonder what they'll think if I actually admit I'm starting to sink. I wonder what people think if I actually came forward for prayer one Sunday. I wonder what they would think. I wonder what they would think if I came forward two weeks in a row. Would they think I'm just really needy? Really got problems? I wonder what people would think. I wonder what people would think if I was going and talking to a psychologist or a counsellor. I wonder what people would think if they heard that. Even though these things might help you become the person that you're meant to become, and shed off some of these other things. But does the fear of man have that much of a grip that would limit us from doing the things we need to do and dealing with the things we need to deal with in order to become the person that God wants us to be? How free are we to become who we're meant to be? man and his wife are awakened at 3 o'clock in the morning. There's a loud pounding on the door. The man gets up and he goes to the door. And there's a drunken stranger standing there in the rain. It's pouring down. And he says, can I have a push? Not a chance, says the husband. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. He slams the door, returns to bed. When he gets into bed, his wife says, who was that? He says, oh, it was just some drunk guy asking me for a push. 
She says, did you help him? He says, no, I didn't. It's three o'clock in the morning and it's pouring rain outside. The wife says, can't you remember about three months ago when we broke down and those two guys helped us? I think you should help him and you should be ashamed of yourself for not helping him straight away. The man does as he's told, of course. He gets dressed. He goes out into the pouring rain. He calls out into the dark. Hello, are you still there? And yes, comes back the answer. Do you still need a push? Calls out the husband. Yes, please, comes the reply from the darkness. Well, where are you, says the husband. I'm over here on the swing, comes the reply. (laughs) But hey, at least he asked for help. At least he asked for help. Does the fear of man hold you back? from getting the help you need to become the person that you're meant to become? Does the fear of man hold you back from asking for prayer? Does the fear of man hold you back from asking questions? Does the fear of man hold you back from saying, I don't get it, I don't understand? Does the fear of man keep your doubts locked up on the inside of you? What impact is the fear of man having on you and your growth as a person? Are you becoming the person you're meant to? Or is the fear of man a snare, stopping you, pulling you back and limiting you? The second thing is that the fear of man will actually stop you doing what you're actually meant to do. Fear will try to stop you doing what you're actually meant to do. Um, yeah, I remember the first time I ever stood up in front of a crowd and spoke. I, was, I, I got saved at 19. A couple of weeks later, a youth minister, a youth worker in Balna, uh, contacted me and said, I, I, I've heard that you've, you've given your life to Jesus and uh, we've got a, a religious education day at Balna High School. Would you like to come and you can share your story with the kids at Balna High? And, I, and to be honest with you, I was newly saved and I thought, well, Jesus died, beaten, bashed, everything that went through for my salvation. And on the other hand, me just standing up in front of it, it was a year seven class, he said at the time. Me standing up in front of a year seven class, which is probably about 25 kids, telling them about Jesus. Yeah, I can do that. That's a fair trade-off. Jesus, I'll do that for you. Of course I will. You know? So I rock up on the day to the school thinking I'm going to be standing there with a, uh, going into a classroom and the guy meets me and goes, oh, look, uh, thanks for coming today. There's been a couple of changes. However, just need to let you know, it's not just one grade seven class, it's all of grade seven. Now, at that stage, Ballina High School was the third largest high school in the state of New South Wales. We didn't have all the other schools around like we do now. We were the third largest high school in the entire state of New South Wales. And I thought, oh, yeah, okay, fair enough. I'm here now. I guess, we'll do it. And he said, oh, and by the way, it's not just grade seven now, they've also included all of grade eight and all of grade nine. (laughs) How do you feel about that? Inwardly, I went, ah! Outwardly, I went, yeah, cool, I can do that. (laughs) Anyone else like that? Inwardly, it's all going on, but outwardly, yeah, it's okay. Then he says, and by the way, it's not just all of grades seven, eight, and nine, it's all of the teachers from the whole school are going to be there as well. Inwardly, I went, ah! Outwardly, I went, yeah, sweet, no worries. (laughs) Oh, good. Anyway, cut a long story short, someone is up there before me and they're playing on the guitar and it was something like, you know, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. And then, of course, the guy gets up and goes, oh, thank you for that. Hey, I want to introduce to you guys now an ex-student. He was here at your school just a few months ago and he's given his life to Jesus and I want you to give Alan Kirchner a hand as he comes and shares with you. And so I walk up on stage and this is exactly how it happened. I've got one of these microphones in my hand as I walk up and I'm looking down at the ground because I want to look at the crowd because I was the kid, I went through my entire high school career and literally wagged every single day at school where you had to stand in front of anyone and say anything. And that's the truth. Whenever there was a presentation to be done, I would go to the beach or I would go to the, the, the milk bar or something. I got through my entire school career, I think only once did I ever have to stand in front of a school classroom and say something because I was so afraid of standing in front of people and communicating about anything anything. If it was a party and I could be the class clown, sweet. But the minute it was anything other than that and I was not in control and I had to stand up and do a presentation, I ran a mile my whole life. I ran a mile from it. And so I walk up and I'm looking down at my feet and then the last minute I realise I'm going to have to look out at the crowd. So I lift up my eyes and I look out at the crowd and I just see this auditorium with hundreds and hundreds of kids and teachers all standing around the, the, the walls. And these are all the teachers that have had me for the last few years. I've sort of finished my uh, 11 and 12 uh, I did at Bellman. And all the teachers, and they're all with their arms folded, and they're all looking at me. And, and I'm just thinking, this was the dumbest decision I've ever made in my entire life. And I've made some dumb decisions, by the way. But this is the top of the cake. So I get up there, and when I look out, all of a sudden, 
I see this sea of people, so I think I've got to just fix my eyes on one, one place because if I can just pick one place and look there the whole time, no matter how stupid it looks, maybe I'll be able to focus. So I decide I'm just going to pick a kid over here and look. And so I go right out, I'm going to pick a kid over there. I turn, I look, and I stare down, and I locked eyes with my little sister, six years younger than me, sitting there. She looks up at me, and she turns to her friends. <laughs> and they're all laughing. I thought, this is terrible. So what did I do? I thought, I've got to look at the other side of the auditorium. So I lift up my eyes, and I looked across to the other side of the auditorium. And what do you think happened? The first person I looked at was my little cousin, same age as my sister. What is she doing? The same thing. (laughs) And all them kids are now laughing at me. And so I thought, where do I look? What I'm going to do is I stared at the back wall, and there was an open door. I looked straight out at the road, so I wasn't making eye contact with anyone. Then I went to pick up the microphone to talk, and here's literally what happened. And that, that's actually pretty much how big the shaking was. It wasn't some little thing. It was so big, everybody could see that this mic's freaking out on me. So I thought, oh, my goodness, what do I do to take the weight off my hand? And then my knees started going like this. So I thought, the only thing I can do to take the weight, and literally, I'm, like, I'm standing there like this. It just, and, and I'm about to say to the kids, come to Jesus, you can be like me. And so I'm doing this and the knees are going and I thought the only thing I can do is walk to the edge of the stage because it's a pretty big stage and what I'm going to do is sit on the edge of the stage and I'm going to let my feet dangle on the ground so there's no weight on my feet, they'll stop knocking. And so I did that and of course the legs stopped knocking but I'm sitting there like this with the hand. So I thought maybe what I need to do is take weight off my arm like I did my feet. So I got my elbow and I put it like this and I'm standing there like this and I ended up in this actual position starting to talk to these kids and say, come to Jesus and you can be just like me. I finished my thing. I literally threw the mic down. I jumped off the stage, ran through the middle of the entire group, out the back door into a mate's car, went to the beach and said, I will never, ever do anything like that ever again for the rest of my life. That was my declaration. That was my declaration. Fear of man almost robbed me of the very gift that God placed upon my life. I wonder how many of us are not fully doing what we were made to do, maybe because the snare of the fear of man has got a hold of you at some point. You've got a certain amount of freedom, but you hit a point and you're restricted. You can't go any further. The fear of man is a snare. The fear of man is a snare. You know, we're not always going to get it right too, by the way. I feel like moving in the Holy Spirit, when we're talking about moving in the Spirit, it's, it's very much like getting out of the boat, isn't it? It's very much like stepping into unfamiliar territory. It's very much like putting yourself in a place where, where you've just got to fully depend on God. You've got to fully depend on God. And sometimes you're going to get it wrong. I remember in, in Bundaberg many years ago, uh, I, I, I was uh, sort of getting all fired up about the things of God. It was early in my, fairly early in my faith. And I was really fired up about God wanting to use me. And I used to pray. I used to actually have this attitude that, God, if you ever want to do anything anywhere, I want to be the first person you go to. If you want to say something, do something, you want someone to be prayed for for healing, you want to, I don't care what it is, God. If you want to do something anywhere where I am, I want to be that first person. I want to be the first name that pops into your head and you drop it into my spirit and say, Alan, here's an invitation for you to do it. Because I want to take every invitation that you have for me. And I remember this one day, I'm walking down the street in Bundaberg, it's summer, it's really, really hot, and I'm just thinking about God and really excited about God, and I saw this guy on the other side of the road coming towards me. As soon as I looked at him, it was clear as a bell. I saw in my mind's eye the word Barry. Barry. And so I kept on walking, and I'm thinking, God, this is going to be awesome. Because I don't know this dude, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say Barry, and he's going to go, what? And I'm going to go, yeah, don't be excited about that. I don't know you. God does. And he got your attention, so I can tell you this message. Jesus loves you, and he died for you. Barry was going to get saved and go on and change the world. And I looked up as I got a bit closer, and then I got to get up the courage, and I looked up, and he's about there, and I said, hey, Barry. And he looked up at me and went, nah. And I went, oh, sorry, I thought you were someone else. And I just kept on walking really, really quick. And I got out of that place as quick as I could. Sometimes when you get out of the boat, sometimes when you break those shackles off, sometimes you're going to get it wrong. Peter walked, but he also sank, didn't he? And I think if we're going to get out of the boat and walk, and if we're going to try to free ourselves from the fear of man, we're actually going to say, hey, I want to be people that step out and be used by God. You've got to be prepared that you're going to sink at times. That's just what happens when you walk on water. You sink. 
You've got to learn how to sink. Sinking is not the end. Peter didn't drown. He didn't die. He was pulled back up to the surface of the water by God. Sometimes you're going to get it wrong. But you know what? Here's the exciting thing. Sometimes you're going to get it right. Sometimes you're going to get it right. And it's going to bring great freedom and liberty. Not only to yourself, but to others. I was in Chinchilla one time and there was a group of us and we were ministering in Chinchilla High School. And I remember uh, we were all billeted out, staying at different places. I was on a farm out in the middle of, of, of Chinchilla somewhere. And I got up really early one morning and the bus was going to pick me up and went and picked all the members of the team up. There was about six of us, take us to the high school. We were going in and we would do dramas and we would, 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 would preach and we would share testimonies back when you could freely go into all the schools. And I remember I'm walking around this dam the morning before the bus picked me up and I'm just praying. And, and this, is, this is all kind of new and weird to me. And as I'm praying, I just had this image, this picture popped into my mind. I saw a girl. One girl had long blonde hair. Another one had long, I think it was brown hair and glasses. And I saw these two faces. It was really weird. It never had happened to me before like that. And I see these faces. And so I'm walking around. I'm going, well, God, that's kind of strange. This is, out, this, is, this is outside of my kind of box, this stuff. So, Lord, what do I do? And I thought, well, I don't know what to do, so I'll just pray for those girls. I don't know who they are. So I started praying for these two girls. God, whoever they are, God, would you just show them that you love them just like you showed me that you love me. With this girl. I finished my walk. The bus rocks up. I get on the bus. We go to Chinchilla. Before we get out on stage, there's a big stage like this curtain. We're behind the curtain as a team and we're just praying. And uh, I'm the youngest believer in this team. The, the guys leading the team have been walking with the Lord for a long time. And I remember as we, began to, as, as we began to pray, and one of them said, okay, anyone f- feel or sense anything we should be praying for, for this particular meeting? And I felt like the Holy Spirit reminded me of these two faces. But you know what I thought? I'm not going to, that's dumb. There's no way that I'm going to put myself out there and say, hey, and describe these two girls. Like, what if it's nothing, God? What if it's just a ham sandwich? Or I've got no idea what this thing is. So, so I'm, I'm battling the fear of man in that moment. Do I step out? Do I accept the invitation of God? Do I do something with this, knowing that it, it, it could be wrong? But you know what? It could be right, too. Sometimes we live too much in the space of what if it's not God, and we don't entertain the thought, what if it is? What difference could it make? What could happen if it is? And so finally I bit the bullet and I said, this is going to sound really strange and weird. Please don't laugh at me. But this morning I had a picture of these two girls and I described these two girls, long blonde hair, sort of tall, skinny girl, long blonde hair, other one, long brown hair, but she had glasses, black glasses on as well. And my leaders were brilliant. They were fantastic. They said, Alan, thanks so much for sharing that. Hey, why don't we all pray for those girls? Alan, why don't you lead us in prayer for the girls? And so we prayed for these girls. I wasn't expecting anything. We go out there, we do our dramas, we do our testimonies, we do the whole program program finishes and at the end of the program what happens is uh, everybody goes and talks to people I, I, I just go and unplug all of our sound equipment and everything because I, I was fairly um, uh, green I guess so I'm unplugging all the sound gear that we'd set up and I'm loading up in the bus and I'm grabbing the last lot of speakers and I'm packing them up and I look up and I see the far end of the auditorium the back left hand corner I look up and I see this, this 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 face this girl comes and stands in the doorway and she's got long blonde hair and I go oh I've actually seen that face before. And then she disappears. And I'm just standing there staring at the door thinking, this is strange. The next thing, the face comes back again. And this time she steps into the auditorium and marches towards the back to a young girl called Christy who was on our team who happened to be up the back of the auditorium. She marches into Christy. And I'm watching this girl. Next thing you know, this girl with long brown hair and black glasses steps in and does the same thing, walks up. And there they are, those two girls that we prayed for. They're sitting there up the back, and Christy's talking to them. I, I, I was so excited. I packed up the gear, last speaker, carried it to the van. Everybody else was already waiting in the van. I don't know why Christy wasn't in the van. Everyone's in the van waiting for me. And I just said, guys, guess what? Christy's talking to the girls. So we all prayed together in the van for these two young girls. I reckon Christy was with them for about 45 minutes, half an hour, 30, 45 minutes. At the end of that, she comes back into the van. And she says, you know what, those two young girls, they had some really, really interesting questions about faith and they both decided then and there we want to give our lives to Jesus. And they gave their life to Jesus that day. I'm not saying that wouldn't have happened if I didn't step out. What I'm saying is it's a part of my story now. It's a testimony I have. And it's another opportunity for me to go back and go, every time the fear of man goes to grip me, I go back to some of these things and I go, well, I stepped out and it was God. And it's worth it. I don't want to live my life in a snare. Who wants to live their life in a snare? I don't want to live my life in a snare. If you live your life in a snare, it'll have the illusion of freedom. But you'll know on the inside of you that you're not being the person God's called you to be and you'll certainly know that you're not doing and walking in and accepting the invitations that God 
has for you. I'll finish with this. In John chapter 12, and this is the real issue. This is the real issue for us as believers. And it's going to get bigger as time goes on. John 12, verse 42 to 43. It says, yet at the same time, many, many, even among the leaders, believed in him. Jesus is preaching and teaching and healing and doing miracles. And it says many people were believing in him. It says even many among the leaders, people of influence, people of power, people of prestige, these people were believing in Jesus. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear they'd be put out of the synagogue. They were afraid to be honest about who they were, which in turn stops you from being honestly doing what you're meant to do. And verse 43 explains why. For they loved human praise more than praise from God. At the end of the day, this is the real issue when it comes to fear of man or trusting God. Whose praise are we living for? Whose approval are we seeking? And by the way, there's nothing wrong with seeking approval. I think we were made for approval. God himself wants to be accepted by his creation. And I think there's a part of us that's the same. I want to be accepted by people. But there are times and moments in life where I've got to make decisions that will make me acceptable to God and maybe not so acceptable to the world around me. The real issue when it comes to fear of man is whose approval, whose praise are we seeking after the most. And I pray that we would be people that would seek first the praise of God. If we're seeking the approval and praise of men, we're living in a snare. What you do will change. How you act will change. The person you become will change. The way you think will change. What you agree with will change because you'll be held in place by a snare to be best friends with the world, I guess. is a good way to put it. But I'm not prepared to sacrifice my best friendship with God for the approval of men. Amen.